Catholicism is one of the most convenient religions to be a part of because you can live in sin all your life without anyone holding you accountable. Catholicism is there to baptize you and bury you. In between your baptism and your burial, you figure out your own life. The Mary of the Bible recognized that she was a sinner. The Mary of the Bible recognized that she needed a savior and she turned to Jesus her savior tens of millions of Catholics who are alive today will never make it to heaven if they continue in that path Catholics in general can be saved today if they put their trust in Jesus alone and not in Roman Catholicism with all it John chapter 14 and verse 6 Jesus said to him I am the way I am the truth and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Question for you. Do we need a theologian to explain that simple straightforward scripture? No. Too simple. Even a child can understand it. There are many warnings against idolatry in the Bible. And here are a few of them. To set the stage as we move into the teaching. Exodus chapter 32 verse 1 through 8. Listen carefully. When Moses didn't come down the mountain right away, the people went to Aaron. Look, they said, make us a God to lead us. Give me your gold earrings. Aaron melted the gold, then molded it into the form of a calf. The people then exclaim, O Israel, this is the God that brought you out of Egypt. When Aaron saw how happy the people were about it, he built an altar before the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a feast to Jehovah. Tomorrow there will be a feast to Jehovah. Are you listening? They're calling a calf Jehovah. Then the Lord told Moses, quick, go down. For your people that you brought from Egypt have defiled themselves. They have molded themselves a calf and worshipped it. Brothers and sisters, that's the perfect picture of Catholicism. Manufacturing idols of Mary, Joseph, baby Jesus, the crucifix, the saints, and then worshipping it. And saying, this is the mother of God. This is the Jesus who died for you. So, this idolatry in Catholicism is nothing new. It was almost from the very beginning. Where they called idols, images, their God. And started to worship it. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 15 through 19 says... Take careful heed to yourselves. This is God Almighty speaking. Take careful heed to yourselves. For you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Lest you act corruptly and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of any figure. The likeness of male or female. And take heed lest you feel driven to worship them. And serve them. Pay attention to what the Lord said. The Lord said when I appeared to you and I spoke to you. You didn't see anything. You only heard me. What is idolatry? Idolatry is trying to form something. Where people say here I can see my God. And I can worship him. God said to the people be very careful. The reason I didn't allow you to see me when I spoke to you is because I'm not giving you any reason to make any kind of image to worship or to talk to. I don't need an image for you to connect with me. In Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 1. Do not make idols or set up carved images. In your land so you may worship them. I am the Lord your God. 
Deuteronomy chapter 27 and verse 15. Cursed, would you say that with me? Cursed, one more time. Now listen to what the Bible says. Cursed is the one who makes a carved or molded image an abomination to the Lord. Two things here. Carved images, idols, are an abomination to the Lord. In other words, God doesn't like them. He hates them. And secondly, people who make them and bow down to them, curse themselves. The Roman Catholic Church is one of the most sophisticated, well-polished, idolatrous religions or religious body on the earth. Idolatry is the basis of Roman Catholicism. Why do Catholics have idols in their homes? Stay with me to the end of this teaching to find out. Though Catholics may be well-intentioned, they have been ignorantly deceived by the dark Catholic system. From the popes to the cardinals, the archbishops, bishops, priests, deacons, and nuns, the Catholic clergy has been deeply smeared with sexual immorality, homosexuality, abortions, pedophilia, and idolatry throughout the ages. The Catholic Church unlike what they say, is not the one and only true church on the earth. Their priesthood is outdated and abolished by the everlasting priesthood of Jesus Christ. Like the Pharisees, Roman Catholicism may be highly esteemed among men, but their idolatrous acts are an abomination to God. Colossians chapter 2, verse 20 through 23. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations according to the commandments and doctrines of men? These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Listen to that scripture. I just told you that Catholicism has been smeared throughout history with all kinds of sinful acts. And why? Does that happen? Because man-made religion is no match for the cravings of the flesh. The Jesus of the Holy Bible, the Jesus of the Catholics is not the Jesus of the Holy Bible. Let's prove it. Here is what the Bible teaches about Jesus Christ of the Father. Listen carefully because we're going to cross check it. The Bible teaches us in Luke chapter 1 verse 26 through 35 that Jesus is born of the Virgin Mary. The Bible teaches in Philippians 2 5 through 11 that Jesus was God incarnated in the human flesh. The Bible teaches in Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 14 and 15. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And rose again on the third day. He's not on a cross anymore. He rose again on the third day. And finally there. The Bible teaches in Luke chapter 24. Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 7. Jesus ascended into heaven. 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And notice I have in bold letters where he still is today. My question to you, the Bible teaches that Jesus is where today? He is in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Now, that's the biblical Jesus. That's what the Bible teaches about Jesus. Now let's take a look at the Catholic Jesus. The Catholic living Jesus is the Eucharist. Please listen. The Catholic living Jesus is the Eucharist. The wafer served in the Catholic Mass. The Catholic dead Jesus is still on the crosses that they worship. That's why whenever you see a Catholic or you go into a Catholic church, there is always a cross like the one you see behind me, but there's still a Jesus on the cross because they are yet celebrating a dead Jesus, not a living Jesus. Their living Jesus is in a wafer. But yet the Bible teaches that the Jesus of the Bible is in heaven at the right hand of the Father, not in a wafer, not on a cross, but in heaven at the right hand of the Father. So the Jesus of the Bible and the Jesus of the Catholic Church are two different Jesuses. I will quote from the Council of Trent because this is one of the most dare, concise, and highly revered statements of the Catholic doctrine. So I'm not just slandering a church. I am not just judging a church, condemning a church. This is their own doctrine that they hold daily. Listen to it. This is now from the Council of Trent. If anyone denies that in the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist, they're talking about the wafer, if anyone denies that in the sacrament of the Most Holy Eucharist are contained truly and substantially the body, the blood, the soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, but instead says that he is in it only as a symbol or a sign, let him be anathema, divinely cursed. These are Catholic words. In layman's terms, simple terms, if any human being dare say against the Catholics, that Jesus is not in that wafer. Nor his body, nor his blood, nor his soul. You are divinely cursed by God according to Roman Catholicism. Listen again from the Council of Trent. If anyone denies that in the venerable, that word venerable, is another word for worship. If anyone denies that in the venerable sacrament of the Eucharist, the whole Christ is contained in every part of each form when separated, broken, let him be anathema, divinely cursed in layman's term. This is what they're saying. If any human being says that in that wafer, when broken in two pieces, four pieces, six pieces, that in all those pieces that are broken, there is not the body, the blood, the soul of Jesus in each broken piece, let him be divinely cursed. Continuing from the Council of Trent. If anyone says 
that in the holy sacrament of the Eucharist, Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is not to be adored. Now, are, are, are you queuing in deeper? Listen to what they're saying. This is not my words. This is their own writings, their own doctrine. If anyone says that in the holy sacrament of the Eucharist, Christ, the only begotten Son of God, is not to be adored with latria. What does the word latria mean? Supreme worship to God alone. Nor to be solemnly borne about in adoration in processions according to the universal custom of the Holy Catholic Church or is not to be set publicly before the people to be adored, let him be anathema, divinely cursed. Layman terms, Catholics are to adore the wafer. They are to worship the wafer. Because that wafer, according to Catholic doctrine, is the body, the soul, the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, adore that piece of bread. Romans chapter 12 and verse 14 says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So Catholicism is wrong to curse people for first of all not believing that the Eucharist is Jesus and second of all for not wanting to worship it. The Bible says when we are offended, when we're persecuted, we're not supposed to curse. We're supposed to bless. Did you see that in the Bible? It says bless those who persecute you, persecute you, bless and do not curse. But yet the Catholic doctrine says you are cursed. If you do not adore that piece of wafer that they believe Jesus is in. What Roman Catholicism is plainly stating is that the little wafer called the Eucharist and the wine used in the Catholic Mass are actually Jesus in his whole divinity. And that's what the Catholic doctrine is saying. That that little piece of wafer is the complete Jesus Christ in his divinity. But look at what the Bible says about where Jesus is at the moment. Now remember, Catholics are saying that Jesus is in that little piece of bread. Jesus is dwelling in that Eucharist, in that piece of wafer. But look at what the Bible says about the biblical Jesus. Acts chapter 1 and verse 9. Right after he spoke those words, the disciples saw Jesus lifted into the sky and disappeared into a cloud. So Jesus is not on the earth again. He disappeared into a cloud. And where did he went? Look at Acts chapter 7 verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. But the Catholic Jesus is in a piece of bread. The Catholic Jesus is in the Eucharist. The Catholic Jesus is in a wafer. But the biblical Jesus, according to Acts 7.55, is in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 12 says. But our high priest Jesus offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, not in the Catholic Mass twice a day being crucified. Our high priest Jesus offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. Now listen. Then... He sat down in the place of honor at God's right hand. But the Catholic Jesus is in a piece of bread. The Catholic Jesus is in a wafer. The Catholic Jesus is in the Eucharist. And then the Council of Trent 
which teaches Catholic doctrine, says now that you are to adore and highly worship the Jesus in that bread. But the Bible Jesus is in heaven. But Catholics say, worship the Jesus in that bread. But the Bible says, Jesus is in heaven. Why am I stressing this to you? Well, because the Jesus the Catholic proclaims is not the Jesus of the Bible. And if he is not the Jesus of the Bible, but yet they insist that Jesus is in the wafer, then I can tell you something that you might not know. In that wafer is actual, actually a demon and not Jesus. You're actually adoring, worshipping a demon spirit and not the true Jesus of the Bible. Are you with me so far? That Eucharist, the wafer made by man's hand, is an idol that Catholics bow down to and worship. But we are forbidden from making or bowing down to idols or images. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4 and 5. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. So number one, Catholicism is wrong for making that carved image they call Jesus. It says, of any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Then number two, first of all, it says don't make it. Then second of all, it says, and you shall not bow down to them or serve them. So, when we talk about Jesus Christ, the Catholic Jesus is not the Jesus of the Bible. Why? Because Jesus is in heaven and they, with all their might, declare that Jesus is in that wafer. But the Bible says that Jesus is in heaven. Now, they so believe that Jesus is in that Eucharist, that they also made another carved object to hold the carved wafer. It's called the Catholic monstrance. Have you ever heard that word before? Monstrance? Well, it's simple. Look at the image I placed there for you on your outline. I want you to watch it well. And then I want you to look at the other image of the priests bowing down. Are you seeing that? So there at the altar is the monstrance. And there in the monstrance is the wafer. The monstrance is a holder for the wafer. The word monstrance means to demonstrate, to show. So that carved object that holds the wafer is to show the wafer, Jesus, in the wafer. The monstrance, I want you to look at the monstrance on your paper. The monstrance is designed with a sunburst around the wafer. Are you, are you seeing it? So around the wafer is a sunburst. The sunburst, brothers and sisters, comes from sun worship, paganism. Or at least that was the original intent by Latin American Catholic missionaries. The sun burst. Doesn't matter what the intent may be. The sun burst represents sun worship, paganism. And so really, when a priest bows down at the altar and the people bow down to that monstrance and the wafer inside of it, they're actually engaging in paganism. Why? Why? Because the sunburst on the monstrance 
comes from paganism. And secondly, that wafer is not the Jesus of the Bible. Jesus is in heaven. So really, if you insist that there is something within that wafer, it must be a demon and not Jesus who does not leave heaven to come at the beck and call of a priest. Catholics must bow, kneel in worship of the monstrance and the wafer. Why? They say, because Jesus humbles himself. Now listen please. Why do they bow down to that monstrance and the wafer in there? Because they say, Jesus humbles himself to come before us as a piece of bread. Why do they bow down to it? Because Jesus humbles himself to come to us in a piece of bread. Jesus, according to the Bible, humbled himself one time before the human race. And that was to bring salvation to the human race. And the Bible says Jesus is coming again another time to judge the world. He is not coming humbly anymore. But yet, Catholic doctrine says that the reason they bow down to the monstrance and the wafer is because every time the priest lifts up the monstrance with the wafer, Jesus quickly flies in from heaven into that piece of bread so that when you eat it, you're actually receiving the body and blood of Jesus. And whenever the Catholic does or, or the priest does a mass, we're talking about the daily mass, we're talking about the morning mass, the evening Mass, we're talking about the Mass for Novena and all kinds of Masses. Whenever the priest does a Mass and lifts up that Eucharist, Jesus must obey and come and take up residence in that piece of bread because Catholics are ready to receive Him. Brothers and sisters, I'm trying to make this as clear as you can understand it. Who is, control, who is in control? A priest or Jesus Christ? Who should obey who? Does Jesus really have to obey a priest's call? Or should a priest obey Jesus' call? Catholic priests must cover their hands to prevent them from touching the monstrance because the wafer makes the monstrance holy. If you've never seen that, you can go and Google it. Whenever the priest will touch the monstrance, he has to cover his hands. His bare hands cannot touch it. Why? Because they believe that that piece of bread, the wafer, the Eucharist, within the monstrance, makes the monstrance holy, and you should not have personal contact with it. By the way, there are all kinds of monstrance that holds the Eucharist. And some of them are heavily adorned with stones of all colors. As a matter of fact, when you look at it, instantly you can detect idolatry. Because there's more to be seen on the monstrance than actually the little wafer that is in the center. If this wafer was really Jesus. I believe. I believe. Now this is just my opinion. I believe if that wafer had more importance than the monstrance. I think the thing that should be mainly seen would be the wafer and not the monstrance. But the truth is. The monstrance is far bigger than the Eucharist. And heavily decorated. So when your eyes catches the montrance, you, you don't even see the Eucharist. All you see is the gold and, and the heavily decorated stones all around the monstrance. As the priests carry the wafer 
in the monstrance, in processions, everyone bows down as it passes by. Now remember, I want you to put your two cents together. And I'll put my one cents together. As the monstrance and the Eucharist passes by, Catholics must bow in adoration of this Eucharist within the monstrance. But if the Bible says Jesus is in heaven, then when they bow down, when the monstrance and the Eucharist passes by, it's idolatry. Because you're calling God a piece of object. So we're talking about sophisticated idolatry. Well-polished idolatry. Jesus is in heaven. So if the monstrance passes with the Eucharist in the hand of the priest and anyone bows down to it and the Bible says Jesus is not in it but in heaven, then this is an act of idolatry. Jesus is in heaven, not in the monstrance. Look at what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.16. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know Him thus no longer. Very important piece of scripture. The Catholics are still recognizing a Jesus that came in the flesh. But yet the Bible says, we previously knew Jesus in the flesh, but he is no longer in the flesh. So we now not adore him or recognize him as a piece of bread. We recognize him as a spirit, Jesus in heaven once again. According to Catholic tradition, a Bohemian priest who doubted the doctrine of transubstantiation one day saw the Eucharist bleeding, falling to the ground. The blood was in the shape of the face of Jesus. According to to the Bohemian priests. I want to share with you something very important. In Matthew 16, 4, listen to what Jesus said. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Now let's stop there for a moment. Let me have your attention again. The Bohemian priest was looking for a sign. He did not believe that in that Eucharist was the body, the blood, the soul of Jesus. He heavily doubted it. So he was seeking a sign. I really need something to prove to me that this Eucharist is Jesus Christ. But Jesus said, this wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, let me ask you. This priest, Bohemian priest, saw the Eucharist become blood dripping to the ground in the face of Jesus Christ. But the Bible says, God will not give signs to this generation. Therefore, if God says that you accept by faith and not by sign, I want to suggest to you that when you're looking for signs, instead of using faith, demons will appear to give you lying signs and wonders to make you believe. That what you think may be what the church says is really that, but it's a demon instead. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 2, 
verse 9 and 10. The coming of the lawless one is in according to the working of Satan. With all power, listen, signs and lying wonders. How does Satan work? With lying signs and wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Because they did not receive the truth. What did this priest see? Now I, I have no doubt that if he says he saw blood, he saw blood. If he saw the face of Jesus, he saw the face of Jesus. But I also have no doubt that the blood he saw and the face he saw were demonic representations. Why? Because Jesus is still in heaven. He is not in a piece of bread. His blood is not dripping from a cross anymore. His blood, the Bible says, he took into the Holy of Holies in heaven where he paid for the sins of humanity. You must understand every religious doctrine from any religion on the earth must be measured with Holy Scripture. And if it does not line up, it's heresy. So whenever a priest worships or a person worships an image, they're actually worshiping a demon of Satan. Listen, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 20. Absolutely not. However, I am implying that when an unbeliever offers a sacrifice to an idol, now we're talking about what? The monstrance. We're talking about the wafer, the Eucharist, which is an idol. It says it is not offered to the true God, but to a demon. And what makes me beyond the shadow of a doubt believes that the wafer and the monstrance is an idol and that there is a demon there because the true Jesus is in heaven. He says, and I don't want you to be participants with demons. Jeremiah 1.16 says, I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness. Why? Because they have forsaken me and worship the work of their own hands. What did God say to the Israelites? He says, when I appeared to you, you did not see me. You only heard me. So don't make anything that you think looks like me because I didn't show you what I look like. And then he says, now you've made something with your own hands and now you worship it and you call it me. Are you getting the picture of what I'm saying? They made the Eucharist. They made the wafer. They now worship it and call it Jesus. Now, let's move on to the second one. Let's talk quickly about the Mary of the Holy Bible. And then we're going to contrast it with the Mary of the Catholics. First, Mary of the Holy Bible was a sinner like every other human being. Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and 47. And Mary said, not the Catholic Church, Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. The Mary of the Bible recognized that she was a sinner. The Mary of the Bible recognized that she needed a Savior. And she turned to Jesus, her Savior. Secondly, the Mary of the Bible directed attention to her son Jesus and not to herself. What is the Catholic Church doing? Directing attention to Mary. But the Mary of the Bible never directed attention to herself. The Mary of the Bible directed attention 
to Jesus. John chapter 2 verse 4 and 5. Jesus said, Dear woman, that's not our problem. My time has not yet come. Verse 5. Look at verse 5. But his mother Mary told the servants, Do whatever he tells you to do. Mary didn't say, do what I tell you to do. As a matter of fact, she found out that day at the wedding at Cana when she asked Jesus to turn water into wine. She found out that Jesus was not there to do what she wanted, what she wanted him to do. Jesus was there to do what he came to do. So when Mary found out, that the attention was not hers, but Jesus. She looked at the disciples and said, from now on, do what he tells you to do. The last thing I remember in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, Jesus never told anyone in the Bible to worship Mary. Not even to give her any attention. Now we're talking about the Mary of the Bible. The Mary of the Bible needed to be spirit filled just like all the other disciples. Listen to Acts chapter 1 and verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. Now, now notice now, the Catholic Church today teaches that you pray to Mary. But the Bible is showing us that Mary was praying along with all the disciples. None of the disciples were praying to her. They were all praying together to the Father. That's the Mary of the Bible. Now let's flip the coin and look at the Catholic Mary which has become an idol worthy of worship. Large and small idols are made of the Catholic Mary, which is not the real Mary of the Bible. The purpose of making and marketing these idol images are for nothing less than idolatry. Why? Because the real Mary is not there. Catholics are taught and encouraged to freely pray to the idol of Mary and other saints. The Catholic doctrine teaches this. They made the Catholics images of Mary of different size, different quality. And then the Catholic doctrine now says... From what we made with our hands, you now bow down and you worship her. The Catholics are taught and encouraged to petition Mary for their needs that only she can give. Listen to the last words, that only she can give. They are saying that if you do not petition Mary for your needs... Jesus won't give it to you. Jesus can't help you. Only Mary can help you in your needs. Therefore, the statues, the images, the idols that the Catholic Church manufacture, they tell the Catholics, buy them, put them in your home. We're going to set them in the church. And you bow down and you petition Mary for every need that only she can grant you. Catholics are taught to bow down in veneration to the idol of Mary. If you go and you Google or you YouTube, you'll find many, many photos and many videos of the Pope himself bowing down to a Mary that is an idol because Mary isn't there. The book of Ecclesiastes tells us seven, several times that when someone dies, they go and never come back. So that idol, that image of Mary is nothing 
but a manufactured object that brings the Vatican millions and millions of dollars and it brings the Catholics no answered prayers ever once. Catholics are taught to ask Mary to intercede for them. Now we're talking about the Catholic Mary, not the Mary of the Bible. Because from Genesis to Revelation, nowhere is it taught that we're supposed to ask Mary to intercede. But the Catholic Mary, the Catholics are taught, ask that Catholic Mary, the idol, the image, to intercede for you. This order comes directly from the Catholic Vatican II Council in 1966 where it was said, listen, this is not my words, this is the Vatican II Council. For taken up to heaven, Mary did not lay aside her saving role. But her acts of intercession continues to win for us gifts of eternal salvation. Let the entire Catholic body pour forth persevering prayers to the mother of God, Mary, and the mother of men. This is Catholic doctrine coming from Vatican II Council. That you're supposed to ask her to intercede. Because when she died, her work did not finish. She still saves people. And she still helps people. Now, that is in the Vatican II Council. But find it in the Bible. It's nowhere to be found. So, that Mary that we're talking about at the moment is the Catholic Mary, not the Mary of the Bible. But praying to any dead person, not just Mary or other Catholic saints, is biblically called necromancy. Whether it is Mary who has died, whether it is Joseph, her husband, who has died, whether it is any of the saints who has died praying to any of them, talking to any of them, is biblically called necromancy. Necromancy is contacting the dead. Other names for necromancy might enlighten you a little bit more, might open your eyes a little bit more. Other names for necromancy are black magic. Sorcery and witchcraft. When Catholics are taught to pray to saints that are already dead, to Mary who already died, to Joseph who already died, biblically that is called necromancy and other names for necromancy is black magic, sorcery and witchcraft. And this is what the Bible says about contacting Praying to the dead, which is necromancy. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 10 through 13. Let no one be found among you who practices divination or sorcery, engages in witchcraft, now listen, or who consults the dead. What do Catholics do? They consult the dead. It says, or oh, anyone who consults the dead, anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 15 through 19. Take careful heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of of the fire lest you act corruptly and make for yourselves carved image in the form of any figure in the likeness of male or female 
and take heed lest you lift your eyes to heaven and you feel driven to worship them and serve them. Listen to Luke chapter 4 and verse 8. Jesus replies, Scripture says, you must worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. You must worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Not Mary who is dead. Not the saints who are dead. Not contacting the dead which is witchcraft, sorcery, black magic, necromancy. It says you shall worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Why does the Bible says to worship the Lord your God only? Because it is Him who is alive forevermore. The rest are dead. The Bible does not give us permission to contact the dead at any time. The reason is, it's never the dead you talk to. It is always a demon. 1 Corinthians 10.20 Rather the things which they sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. Where did the worship of the Catholic Mary start? Very important for you to know. There were three Portuguese children by the name of Lucia, Francisco, and Jacinta. Who witnessed the apparitions... Of demons masquerading as what the Catholics called Mary of Fatima of Portugal. They had a series of visits from what they assumed initially to be an angel in 1916 and in 1917. Later, they received monthly visits from a spirit manifesting in a physical manner who claimed to be Mary, the mother of Jesus. The Spirit has since been referred to as Our Lady of Fatima. A national shrine has been built where the apparitions occurred. Now listen again. What is a shrine? Remember now where these three kids saw the apparition of what they say is Mary, but are act is actually a demon, the Catholic Church built a shrine. But what is a shrine? A shrine is a place where people go to worship. A holy object, an image, or a statue. And in this case, what they call Mary. So what are we looking at here again? Idolatry at its best. Yearly, hundreds of thousands of Catholics make pilgrimage to this shrine to dedicate their lives to the service and worship of Mary. They're being initiated into witchcraft and they don't even know. On May 13th, 1946, Pope Pius XII solemnly crowned the statue of Our Lady of Fatima and proclaimed her the queen of the world. This is the Pope now. The one that is supposed to be the Holy Father. The wisest man for the Catholics that they claim is infallible, does not make mistakes concerning morals and faith of the church. This Pope went after the church built a shrine with a huge idol of Mary. The Pope went and crowned that idol the queen of the world. On May 13th, 1983, Pope John Paul II reenacted the ceremony of crowning the idol statue as queen. So here comes another pope that went now and did the same thing. Recrowning the statue and calling it the queen of heaven. In 1986, the pope issued acts of consecration 
of the whole world to Our Lady of Fatima. In other words, the Pope has declared the entire world of which you and I are a part of. They didn't ask us now. In other words, the Pope has declared the entire world to be the property of this demon who masquerade as Mary. Food for thought. Have you ever noticed that only Catholics have apparitions, dreams, and visions of Mary? Have you ever had a dream or vision of Mary? I haven't. And I'm halfway through my life already. And that's because I was a Catholic for the first 20 years of my life. Why don't we have any apparitions of Mary? Because we do not believe that Mary will come back from the dead. But why only do Catholics have these apparitions and dreams and visions? Because they really believe that a dead person can come back to life again. So what do demons do? They take advantage of that erroneous belief. Come in the form of something good and say, see, what you believe is really true. Answer, because demons only visit those who give them the right to come. On the other hand, Jesus who is omnipresent visits people of all religion who are seeking God to save them. So, so remember now, okay? Remember, Hindus never see Mary in apparition. Buddhists never see Mary. Christians never see Mary. Islam never sees Mary. But people of every religion of this world have seen Jesus. Why? Because he is alive forevermore. If the Catholic people had a working knowledge of the Bible, this whole demonic, idolatrous deception of Mary would have been stopped. Listen to what 1 John 4, 1 says. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. What does the Bible say to do? To test the spirits. But how can you test the spirit if your church does not allow you to read the Bible. It is the Bible that lets you know when a spirit is good or bad. From God or from the devil. And Catholics are not trained or taught to read their Bible. So these three individuals that saw this demonic apparition, apparition called it Mary. Because they did not know how to test spirits. Apparently at this point, Lucia was overwhelmed with doubts. As to whether this spirit appearing to her was actually Mary or if it might have been a demon deceiving her. Now listen, I am now going to quote from the writings of Lucia herself who was one of the three children who saw the many appearances of this demon in the form of what they call Mary of Fatima. Here is what Lucia said. How much... This reflection made me suffer. Only God knows. For he alone can penetrate our inmost heart. <clears throat> I began then to have doubts as to whether these manifestations might be from the devil. Why? She was suffering pain. Excruciating pain. And she knew that God doesn't do that. So she started to doubt. I began to have doubts as to whether these manifestations might be from the devil who was seeking by these means to make me lose my soul. What anguish I felt. So, I made known my doubts to my cousins. These are the next two children that was there with Lucia. Who also saw the spirit manifestations. Now here's what the, coven, the, 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 the cousins say. No, it's not the devil, replied Hacinta. Not at all. They say that the devil is very ugly and that he is down under the ground in hell. But that lady we saw is beautiful and we saw her go in to heaven. Now, now notice here with me. They are basing their judgment not on Scripture, what Scripture says. They are basing their 
discerning on what they have heard from other people. It cannot be the devil. Because the devil is in hell. He doesn't come among people. And besides that, people say the devil is ugly. But look at the woman we saw. She's so beautiful. If these children were taught the Bible, not Catholic tradition, they would have known that their doubt was from God. Listen, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Yet, I am not surprised for Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. The devil can do that, but these Catholic children didn't know that. So the grounds on which Lucia and the other two children accepted this demon as being from the Lord was because it wasn't ugly and it went up into heaven. So it must be Mary. I've seen other things gone up into heaven. I've seen the space, space shuttle go up into heaven. I don't call that Mary or God. How sad that Catholics are encouraged, are not encouraged to read and study the Bible. The Christian Bible, by the way. The following are prayers that, that the Catholic Church teach Catholics to pray to the dead for. These prayers are actually necromancy. Why? Because St. Rita is dead. But they're praying to St. Rita. What prayer do they pray to St. Rita? O oh, glorious Rita. You're pleading before the divine crucifix. Notice I have the crucifix on the line. Why? She is referring to Jesus that is still on the cross. Therefore, the prayer to Rita is not about the risen Jesus, but a Jesus that is still nailed to the cross. So pleading before the divine crucifix have been known to grant favors that many would call impossible. Lovely Saint Rita, so devoted in your love for thy crucified Jesus, not the risen Jesus, crucified Jesus, speak on behalf of for my petition. Now listen. Showing thy power with God. So Rita has power before God. Prayer to Saint Padre Pio. Padre Pio. This is a prayer now. Necromancy. Padre Pio. Obtain for me from the Lord the help I need. To be free from anxiety, fear, and worry. I thank you that in my distress and anxiousness, I can call to you and you will answer me. We're talking about necromancy. Who do you think will answer the prayer to Padre Pius? It's going to be a demon. Padre Pio is known, listen, by the Catholic Padre Pio is known as the patron saint of miracles and healing. If you're going through a difficult time, pray to him. Necromancy. Prayer to Saint Joseph. Oh dear Saint Joseph. Now this one isn't lovely. He is only there. Oh dear Saint Joseph. We have full confidence in thy intercession. Wow. Wow. They don't have full confidence in the intercession of Jesus, but they have full confidence in the intercession of dear Joseph. Let not it be said that we invoke thee in vain. And since thou art so powerful with Jesus and Mary, show thy goodness equals thy power. Notice, where did Joseph get his power from? From goodness. Where in the Bible does it say we get powers when we're good? Pray for us, Saint Joseph. Saint Joseph is the patron saint of fathers and families. So come this Father's Day next month, Catholics, males will be praying to Saint Joseph because he answers fathers. Prayer to St. Jude. Most holy, 
Apostle Saint Jude. The church honors and invokes you. Uh, these are all Catholic writings of prayers that Catholics use. It says, pray for me. I am so helpless and alone. Intercede with God for me that visible, visible and speedy help may come. Saint Jude is the saint of hope and impossible. Now what's terribly wrong with these prayers? Let me tell you. All these prayers to these idols make Jesus sound like one, he doesn't care about his people. Why do I have to tell St. Jude, St. Jude, please help me because somehow I'm not getting true to Jesus. You need to go and get true to him for me because it sounds like he doesn't care about me at all. Secondly, it makes Jesus sounds like he has something against his people and wants them to suffer. And thirdly, it makes Jesus sound like he is incapable of hearing the cry of his people. But look at what the scripture says. In Hebrews 7.25, Therefore Jesus is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. Listen carefully. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Why in the world would I need St. Jude when Jesus will pray for me? Why will I need Mary when Jesus will pray for me? As a matter of fact, Mary, Joseph, Jude, Michael, John, Baptist, whatever they are, they're all dead, but Jesus is alive. Psalms 34, verse 15 and 17. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are open to their cry. But the Catholics make it sound... Like Jesus' eyes are closed and his ears are deaf. Therefore, I have to turn to Jude, Joseph, Mary, and all the rest. But the Bible tells us that the eyes of the Lord are open to the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The righteous cries out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. And this is what scripture says about idols. Psalms 135, 15 through 18. The idols of the nations are gold and silver, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. Eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Nor is there any breath in their mouths. Those who make them are just like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. In conclusion then, tens of millions of Catholics who have died in the past have never made it to heaven. Tens of millions of Catholics who are alive today will never make it to heaven if they continue in that path. Catholics in general can be saved today if they put their trust in Jesus alone and not in Roman Catholicism with all its man-made tradition. Catholicism is one of the most convenient religions to be a part of. Because you can live in sin all your life without anyone holding you accountable. Catholicism is there to baptize you and bury you. In between your baptism and your burial, you figure out your own life. Catholics, read your Bible for yourself without the priest or the church. You will be saved by Jesus alone. Now, I want for us, any one of us that have been a Catholic, those of you watching from abroad, and may I suggest to you that all of us came out of Catholicism because the Roman Catholic Church has been the one that has been there from the very inception. So everything leads down from that. All the nonsense that has been coming down all the while, we've all been there. And if you have been initiated, if you, by your parents or, or aunt or uncle or grandparents, were ever given a special clothes to wear because they're praying to Mary or another saint or they've pinned a medal on you or they've taken you before an idol to pray for you, 
especially then you may want to pray this prayer. Now I'd like to ask you to put your outline away. Close your eyes. Bow your heads. And pray this prayer with me in sincerity from your heart. Repeat after me loudly, please. Heavenly Father, I come before your throne of grace. In the name of Jesus, our Lord of Nazareth, who came in the flesh, I confess that Jesus is my Redeemer, Savior, Lord, Creator, and my God. I submit myself to your Holy Spirit, seeking forgiveness for all my sins because of my association with all of my ancestors of flesh and blood and sins of the Roman Catholic Church as we all originate from the first church in Rome. As I agree with you on the sinful nature of these connections, Lord Jesus, I ask you to cancel all curses and the consequences of these sins over me and ask that you will exchange them for blessings. Give back to me sevenfold of all that which Satan stole from me in my ungodly involvement in Roman Catholicism. Heavenly Father, I repent, break, and renounce all trust in the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church, including infant baptism, and the belief that it's one of the seven channels of mercy through which one can hope for salvation. I repent, break, and renounce the casting out of demons by using oil, salt, and the name of Mary. I repent, break, and renounce the belief that infant baptism can make me born again. I repent, break and renounce any loyalty to the Vatican and its yokes of slavery. I repent, break and renounce the sacrament of confession of our sins to a mortal man, the priest. I repent, Break and renounce all the unbiblical titles of Pope, Cardinal, Bishop, Monk, Nun, and Priest, as well as all idols, ritual candles, sprinkling of holy water, and wearing ceremonial attires. I repent, break and renounce the belief that the bread, the Eucharist, is Christ himself. I repent, break and renounce the continual crucifixion of Christ at every communion. I repent, break and renounce the receiving of communion during the ceremony of Catholic Mass. I repent, break and renounce my bowing and worship to the bread as if it is Jesus. I repent, break and renounce the false sacrament that the Holy Spirit is received at confirmation. I repent, break and renounce the lie that non-christened babies go to limbo from where they can be released by our prayers. I repent, break and renounce all prayers to dead people 
and any contact made with the deceased. Spiritism and necromancy. I repent, break and renounce any baptismal confirmation name given to me at baptism confirmation and the tie of that name to any dead saint or familiar spirit of that saint. I repent, break and renounce my loyalty to Roman Catholicism and the lie that I will be cursed if I should confess being sure of my salvation. I repent, break and renounce paying money for the release from the imaginary place of the dead called purgatory. I repent, break and renounce the doctrine of the divinity of Mary and all prayers and worship directed to her. I repent, break and renounce the value attached to meaningless repetitions of words and prayers with the rosary to the saints. I repent, break and renounce from every effect of idolatry or bowing before idols and statutes. I repent, break and renounce making the sign of the cross which has its origin in the occult before my head and the chest. I repent, break and renounce the belief that the Pope holds the key to life and death and that he is the head of God's kingdom on earth. I repent, break and renounce that Peter was the rock. I repent, break and renounce any worship of Mary aiming to establish Satan's Babylonian order on earth. I repent, break and renounce all worship and idolizing of Mother Mary and the belief that she is related to me. I repent, break and renounce all loyalty to the false title of the Queen of Heaven. I renounce the complete system called Roman Catholicism, including their control of the world economy, Freemasonry, the Jesuits, the Illuminati, the Mafia, the Club of Rome, the False Christ, and the Antichrist. I renounce and repent of all participation in the Roman Catholic Stations of the Cross and associated ceremonies. I repent, break and renounce every false burden of this organization. I repent, break and renounce the belief that a bead of the rosary assumes to be a grant from God. I repent, break and renounce wearing jewelry, beads, attire, and all special vestments of Roman Catholicism. I repent, break and renounce the control which the Catholics have over everything behind the scenes and that they are all encompassing entity behind the one world order. I repent, break and renounce the Pope's blasphemies against your word and his equalizing himself to you, Lord. Lord Jesus, destroy every legal right which the devil has in me and all my descendants' lives. Also destroy all proof against us with your Holy Spirit's fire. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Now Lord, 
I ask for complete cleansing. Place that which you have accomplished on the cross together with your resurrection between us and the devils and fill up those areas of our lives with the Holy Spirit. Seal it with your blood, Lord Jesus, to keep Satan out. In the name of Jesus Christ, I bind Satan, Beelzebub, all principalities, powers, rulers of the world, of darkness, the evil spirits around me, and all demons indicated. I oppose them and ask you, Lord Jesus, to rebuke them in your own mighty name. I pray this all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Praise God. I don't know about you. <laughs> Makes me feel good to know that every chain of this cult is broken. We're free to love the Lord Jesus Christ. We need nobody else. He is all sufficient. Amen. <clears throat> Let's pray as we close. Father in heaven, thank you for loosing the chains of darkness. Thank you, Lord, for removing every curse and for breaking every tie of Catholicism and all their false worship from our lives. Thank you, Lord, for making us new in Christ Jesus. And we vow to lift you up, to exalt you, and to serve you only. For you alone are God, the King of kings, and Lord of lords. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah.